All right, good morning, everybody. Time to get started here. Thanks for being here. Semester's wrapping up soon. Oh, one more person there. There we go. Okay, here's what's going on. Vocab creative usage for unit seven is due last night. That's been checked. And we'll have a test over that end of this week. As usual, we'll wrap up the semester. Um, grammar lesson 13 is posted in an intro video. Um, not too much work to do there. Kind of smaller lesson on the complete subjects and predicates. Uh, make sure to complete that by tomorrow night as usual. Obviously, we'll be talking through uh, Mice and Men Part 5. That was due last night. Uh, we'll review in class. Um, hoping to hear from a lot of you and get some participation near the end of the semester that I can still put in. And then I will have Part 6 posted today. That is due by tomorrow night, but it's only like nine pages long. Okay. So, shouldn't be a problem finishing up. Um, and then finally, I've got a little text here. I kind of wrote out some text about the three points that I want you to kind of think about between now and Monday for your in-class uh, essay that's going to that's gonna make up our exam that I talked about yesterday. So just let me know if you have any questions about that, but I think you guys should be good to go on that as long as you kind of just think about it. Maybe even pick down a few notes uh, ahead of time. And that is Monday. English is Monday. All right. Is there anybody here who could share their vocab creative usage? Let me kind of read through those words real fast here. Back. So we're in unit seven. And the words are gird, daunt, flux, hovel, cadaverous, gothic, penury, egress, felicity, excuse me, despot. Anybody got one they can share by any chance? If you can dig it up. While I'm talking and while you may be getting that, um, if you want to go ahead and maybe access your questions for mice and men, so you have them up, whether you speak up or not, get those get those uh, you know up on a screen somewhere, uh, so you can maybe share as we go through and talk. No vocab creative use and shares. Nobody feels spontaneous, fun, and creative today. Patient wait time. Another person here. Okay, moving right along then. Let's talk about of mice and men. Uh, I'm gonna give you another minute to kind of dredge that up and uh, kind of talk about what we see here as a whole. So you might have noticed that you've got this overall plot that is about Lenny and George, right? And their struggles to get by in their dream, quote unquote American dream, which Candy that also get, gets involved in of getting that ranch so Lenny can have his rabbits and they can grow crops and they can actually have a normal, stable life, right? And is that gonna work out or not? That's the main story. But then we have these side stories, right? Um, we have the whole thing uh, with what happens with Crooks, who we don't know very well, but is a pretty sympathetic character because he seems to be going through a lot, none of which he really deserves. He just seems like a hardworking person who's really probably more isolated than anybody, right? So that was a really kind of sad, tragic chapter. And then here we have kind of another side story, right? It's like, it's like Steinbeck is kind of taking these little side stories of here's this type of person and here's this type of person who suffered from, you know, isolation uh, or loneliness in this world for these reasons, you know, because he's an African-American guy. Uh, and in this case, maybe because Curly's wife, but who, by the way, what's kind of odd about the identity of Curly's wife? What do we actually never get? about her, what basic information. Notice how I'm referring to her right now. Curly's wife. Her Thank name. you, Caleb. Yeah, and uh, Lily, whoever that was. That, that Yeah, we, ne we never hear her name. I think that's on purpose. Or I don't think Steinbeck forgot to give her a name. I think that she's just referred to as Curly's wife because that's the only identity that she's able to have in this world. She's not even, she's not even around any other women, you know, let alone have an identity as a woman uh, herself, right? So that's kind of sad and tragic too. So the question is, by the end of this section, do we end up, does she end up being kind of a sympathetic character or not on some level? 
or do we still dislike her for the trouble that she causes? You know, is it her fault or not? That's what we kind of think. You know, that's what we want to kind of think about. And how does that kind of fit in with those overall themes of, of loneliness and isolation? So the first question, if you could look with me, was how does Lenny's problem with this puppy at the beginning of chapter five foreshadow events at the end of the chapter? So you might have kind of had to circle back to really answer this. Um, but what has actually already happened as part five opens, even though it's not depicted directly in the narration of the book, what's what's what what is what has Lenny already done? All even though not on purpose. He killed his puppy. Was that Sandian? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the puppy that he got, it was given to him from the litter of the other dog that they have there, um, he has killed, right? And this is a thing that repeats with Lenny, right? And then obviously, how does that foreshadow what happens uh, at the end of the chapter here? He kills Curly's wife. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any intention of doing that. We see this repeated pattern with Lenny, how he wants to be affectionate. And then when someone gets a little bit scared because he's not really good at controlling his size and his own strength, that they might kind of freak out. An animal might struggle or a human being might kind of freak out. And it's obviously, this is something similar to what happened with uh, you know, the girl with the, with the dress who's, who's described from Weed, the place they were in before they came here. And the same thing happens again, except this time he actually, he actually kills her. So it's pretty horrible, difficult scene. Right. And there's a lot of mixed feelings that you might have, you know, did, did she deserve that or not? We probably must agree that she didn't deserve it. She certainly wasn't trying to do anything bad to Lenny then. Lenny wasn't trying to do anything bad to her, but these things just end up happening, right? Because of the circumstances and here they are. So the incident with the dog is kind of a small version and foreshadowing of what happens with Curly's wife at the end there. And we can continue to talk more about that as we talk about Curly's wife. So the second question was, unlike Lenny and George who dream of the future, Curly's wife clings to a dream from her past. What was her dream? How does Curly's wife show her naivete when she shares it with Lenny? Now let's talk about what that word means first, because if you didn't understand that, it'd be kind of a hard question to answer. You could have easily looked it up, but uh, it's the noun version of, of an adjective. Uh, naive, what is someone if he or she is uh, naive about the world. You guys know that word? They're kind of ignorant. Sorry? They're kind of like in this. Your sound is cutting in and out. Hold on, I'm not sure why. They're kind of like innocent. There you go. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Innocent in a way that uh, he or she doesn't understand the way that the world works, right? Which may be kind of difficult, right? The difficult ways that the world works if you don't get that or understand that. And then when uh, bad things that other people might see coming surprise you, you know, someone might say that you are naive. It doesn't mean that um, you're a bad person and it does usually have connotations of innocence, but it can be a bad thing because it means you're kind of unprepared for the world, right? So what was Curly's wife's dream and how was she kind of naive in the way in the situations that she describes as she tells that to Lenny what you guys have for number two her dream was becoming an actress and then um she like met this guy at like um the I forgot what it was but like some show that was in town or whatever yeah he like pro like promised to like write her a letter but then he I don't think he ever wrote back but like she believed that her mother hid it from her which mm -hmm. is kind of like so what do we think? Did she really have talent? Was that guy ever really planning on giving her some part in some shows or something? No. Probably not, right? Because you can tell she's, you know, maybe through no fault of her own, she's not a particularly intelligent or, or talented person, right? She's attractive, right? And maybe she's a nice person underneath what's happened to her, right? But this guy wasn't giving her any of that. And if anything, it's kind of a, it's almost kind of like a foreshadowing of the situation that we've, it's become a timeless situation. Um, it's really just been un the unfairness of which has been kind of uh, uncovered and exposed like just recently in the last decade. You know, the whole hashtag Me Too movement um, was about the workplace, but it originated in Hollywood. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking about here? With, with female actors coming out and finally uh, admitting that, that they were, you know, sexually harassed or forced into intimate situations by producers and directors in exchange for getting parts, right? And they felt like they couldn't make it, you know, and then did things that they were 
ashamed of later, you know, or didn't want to, or kind of abused. And it sounds like that's probably what happened with Curly's wife, right? That maybe he had a little fling with her with the promise that he was going to get her some kind of part, even if she doesn't put it that way, because she probably feels some shame and embarrassment about it. And of course, he never got back to her, right? So that's, you know, kind of shows maybe part of where she came from and her dreams were shattered too, you know, and she's got this loneliness on top of that. And, you know, maybe that makes her into this person who's kind of desperate to attract attention to herself because she just doesn't have anything else to do, right? So, you know, keep thinking, do we, does that make her a sympathetic character to us? Or does she just mess stuff up? Like, like, like you hear Candy saying later. So up to number three, after Lenny kills Curly's wife, Candy asks George if they're still able to get the house they've dreamed of. But before George answers, the narrator writes that Candy dropped his head, looked down at the hay, he knew. So what exactly did, did he know? That's a pretty easy question, isn't it? What did Candy know about their dream already from that moment, even though he was asking about it? He knew that like George wouldn't continue without Lenny. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's that he won't continue without Lenny or whether he's gonna get wrapped up in the drama of what's going on there, or whether, um, for whatever reason, the whole thing's blown up now, right? It's just not going to happen the way that they thought it would. And, you know, maybe some of us, as we read this book, are thinking to ourselves, boy, that sure would be cool if the three of them could end up living on this ranch and having this totally normal life and, and be happy and have each other as friends. But somewhere in your heart, in your head, you know that Steinbeck is not, that's not going to be the ending of the book, right? Because the purpose of the book is to show the loneliness and the isolation that was going on during the time that he wrote it. And if everything worked out, that wouldn't really express what he's trying to express, right? It doesn't mean the whole world's always going to be like that, but it means that things very often, for the most part, didn't turn out very well for people then because of the circumstances they were in and, you know, what happened to the economy and the environment and everything else during the Depression and the Dust Bowl <clears throat> is what it is. Okay. Number four, uh, what does George tell the man that Lenny would have went south. Is that accurate information there? And if not, uh, why is he saying that? He's trying to lead them the other way so they don't like they don't find on Lenny. He's trying to throw them off the path, right? Whereas we know, kind of dramatic irony there. What, what do we know from the beginning of the story? Hopefully, that Lenny is is doing what? Like go and hide in the bush. Something that like George was telling him about. The place where they were at the very beginning of the story when we first meet them, right? He's trying, he tries to orient Lenny and tells them to remember this place and to come back here if anything bad happens, like what happens in Weed, and something very much like what happened in Weed, even worse, happens. So we, we'd hope that Lenny can get his head together enough and head to that place, but we don't know for sure yet um, if that's happened. All we know is he's, he's taken off. Um, and in the process of him taking off, I don't know whether you notice, but Carlson goes to get his Luger, which is his, his handgun. Uh, and it's missing. And we don't know that George has it. We don't know that Lenny has it. They're afraid that Lenny has it, which makes them view Lenny even more as a, a dangerous fugitive. So this is, you know, not a good situation. And even though he's, Lenny's trying to, or George is trying to throw them off the track, we don't know whether he's going to be successful or not. Um, Candy, ins or excuse me, uh, Curly insists on going with them and he's got a rifle. So this is obviously headed towards some kind of, some kind of uh, dangerous, scary climax here. Okay, uh, last question was, how does Candy feel toward Curly's wife after she's killed? It's kind of an ugly scene, isn't it? What does he, what does he do? That's not gonna change anything. I mean, she's already gone, right? But what, is it, what does he do? What does he say? You don't have to quote him or anything. It's kind of profane, but basically. Lena Farrell, go ahead. Um, basically, I put, after Curly's wife was killed, Curly feels like she ruined every, I mean, Candy feels like she ruined everything and is very angry at her. Page nine emphasizes how he looks hopelessly at Curly's wife and gradually his sor sorrow and anger grew into where it's saying things like, you done it, didn't you? Everybody knows you messed things up. Good, that's definitely how he feels. Is he right? What do you guys think? No, I, I just think that he's like, um, blaming her because he doesn't really have an explanation about like you know what's really going on so he's just trying to like I don't know help things out a little better I guess by like yeah. blaming her. it's understandable on some level because he's sad you know but, but at the same time it almost seems like kind of you know not that I mean Curly's wife's gone it's not like she can hear what he's saying but it's just kind of ugly right it's just reduced him to to blaming someone who was just killed 
right? When she really wasn't doing anything certainly wrong there, right? She was trying to actually being pretty nice to Lenny. You kind of saw a soft spot in her, right? And she recognized that Lenny was kind of an innocent. And she's trying to, you know, she's like, I, I, I can tell you're, you're a nice guy, right? And then she ends up dying and then he's standing over her body, like calling her, you know, a tart and stuff like that. There's no winners here, right? And I would say, you know, probably by the end, we all, I guess, I guess the last prompt is about that, right? Do you think the character's criticism of Curly's wife are fair and warranted? We probably, you know, feel a little bit different about Curly's wife and realize that she's maybe a victim of circumstances, uh, the emotions that come with those circumstances as much as anybody else in the story, you know, maybe even more. Maybe that's why she's so desperate to attract attention to herself, even though it seemed like it would be someone that we would hate, right? Okay, that takes us to the end of part five. I will be posting part six uh, real shortly. I'll get that done during our kind of like long lunch. Uh, period today and you can uh, work on finishing that for tomorrow night and just that and grammar is what you have going on and think about the exam and that's about it anybody have any questions about anything okay thanks for being here tomorrow we will go ahead and have a live session i don't think it'll need to be long and since you'll be live all day i just i just i just won't keep you very long we'll just kind of go over the agenda and stuff but remember you're supposed to go to all your classes tomorrow I'll try to post that schedule since it's a different one. You guys remember that's the, the different live schedule tomorrow, right? I'll put it up on the on, on my agenda just for your reference. Okay, see ya.